I'm very happy about today because today I'm speaking to the potential that I see in this room. And this is very strategic in that I plan this message to take place the Sunday before we split into our two services. The reason we're splitting is not because there's so many of you out there that we don't have space in the room because we could add more chairs. We, we could do that. The reason we're splitting is because, you know, God spoke to me at the end of last year. He said, Chris... Teach your church how to disciple. We're working on that. Who's your, who's your level one disciple? Who are you loving on? Who are you messaging every week? I said, Chris, teach the church on the direction that we're going. So we started defining the direction. What is South Point Church? Where is it that we're going? What are our burdens for? Then he said, Chris, you need to do a volunteer drive. Get a bunch of extra volunteers. Call the church and take ownership and responsibility and see if they respond. We had over 50 people sign up to volunteer over a three week period. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's you guys, that was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And then the fourth thing he said was, it's time, split the service. And so that, that's what we're doing. And, and the reason I get so excited about it is not so that I can say, oh, we're a church with two services or, you know, look at all the numbers. Or the, no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. It has everything to do with the potential that I see out here. And when I look at the potential that's out here, I actually kind of get excited when I think about splitting because it, it, it then doubles the potential, you know. And, and when I think about what we can do in this city and think about, okay, we're going to double that in people, that people and potential, people and opportunity, like that, you know, that's incredible. So that, that's my, my reasoning behind this. And we're going to talk about the message and the, the mission of the church today. But first... A lot of us don't know this. So I wanted to find this for you. The word for church is, is ecclesia. I'm sure I said that wrong, but if you've got a better way to say it, I want you to send Linton a voice note and tell him how to pronounce it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, so what this word actually means, this is the Greek. This is the original word here for it. Um, and it means it, it's the called out ones or, or it's an assembly. You know, the, the point to this is that, is that it, it's the people that are gathering. In fact, we could break this down into two sort of further sections here. And we could say that it's a universal body. So it's the big body of believers, but it's also the local assembly of believers that are gathering for exactly what we're doing today, worship, teaching, and fellowship. So universally, church is sort of the universal identity of believers, Christ followers around the world. And then locally here, we are the local assembly, the gathering of Christ followers that have decided I'm following Christ and I'm coming for worship. I'm coming for fellowship. I'm coming for a teaching. So when people say, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, I can just do church at home by myself. Well, no, you can't. You, I mean, you just can't. You, you actually can worship God at home. You can spend time with God at home. You can, um, you can watch a service at home. But the, the purpose of the meaning of this word is that it is the gathering of the local assembly. It's coming together for the worship, the teaching, and the fellowship. So what that means is that the, the church, it's not the building. It, it's not the building that we're in. Dino, you can pull me down just a little bit. We didn't get a run through this morning, so Dino and I are working together on the fly with my, with my volume here. But the church is, is not a building. It's not this, this, this is not, South Point Church is not this place here. So South Point Church is you guys that are sitting out there. That's, that's actually what South Point is. So Dino, a little more, of, I got a little echo. You can pull me down just a little bit more. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys, for being patient with us here. Um, okay, so let's go into the rest of this here. The local church, I want to make a statement for you guys, and it's this. The local church is the most important institution in the entire world. Now, I think that that's a bold statement. Okay, so I've just defined that you are the church. It's you. Anytime I use the word church for the rest of this message, I mean, I mean you. Okay, so if, if you're... Now, I want to address if we have anyone in here that's not a Christ follower, I meaning you've not given your life to Jesus, you're just visiting, or maybe you grew up in church or, or going to um, a place uh, like a church, but you don't quite identify with that, th that's okay. I, I want you to have a transparent, authentic view 
of what it is that you're considering here. And so as we lay out what it is for us to be the church, you get to make a great and informed decision on whether or not you want to be a part of it or whether or not you don't want to be a part of it. But I can't hide or, or hold back what it is that we're called to be. In fact, we're going to get into it later. As we are what we're called to be, we become even more attractional so that people that aren't Christ followers want to be like us and be a Christ follower. But I, I can say that, that you, as the local church, as the people all around the world, we are the most important institution in the entire world. There's not another institution that's more important than us. And I'll, I'll prove it to you. I've got some stats here. So here's some stats from, uh, from 2022. Christian philanthropy accounted for 70% of all American philanthropy in 2022. And that, that equates to over $300 billion. All right, that, that's a big number. That Christian philanthropy accounted for 70% of that. 40 out of the top 50 strongest philanthropy organizations are faith-based. Uh, that to me, those are big numbers. It's something that, it, that we can't ignore. You know, there's something that's happening within the faith based community. In fact, b because of this, I could say that it's actually statistically proven that the world is better off because of the church. You know, it, it's, this is a, a statistical proven thing here. The world and this society and our culture is better off because the church exists. And so that, that's sort of the stats on it, just some light stats on it. Now, I can talk about what the church has done in my life personally. And, and I know that as I put these things together and as I, I looked at them and researched them, I thought, man, there's, all of you guys will probably identify with some of these things as well. But I, there's four of them here. You know, one of the things the church has done for me, it's informed my conscience, which, which means that it's taught me what's right and what's wrong. All right, so let me give you an example. You've got a 12-year-old. You have a 12-year-old child, and let's say that uh, that child is growing up in one of two environments. You can either send them to sweep the floors at Mavericks on a Saturday morning and a Sunday morning, right? We all know what Mavericks is, yeah. Or they can come to church on a Sunday morning. Which one, you know, would you choose? You know, some people would still not choose church they would still say well I, I hate the church so much I'd rather them go sweep the floors of a strip club than come to a church but the point that I'm making here is that being in this building it it teaches values and even if you're not a Christ follower even if you don't believe in this whole Jesus thing what I know is that our children in our family ministry environments right now are being taught values that no matter what religion you are, it's going to make them better and stronger and more uh, self-confident and kinder and more polite. It's going to make them better people. Because when we get into the church, especially when we're young, it informs our consciousness. It teaches us to treat each other fairly. It teaches us to love our neighbor. It teaches us to be kind, to be patient. You know, there's these things in the Bible called the fruits of the Spirit. Kindness, patience, gracious, love. So all these things that are fruits of the Spirit, we teach this to our kids and to you guys. And what that ends up doing is that it informs your consciousness and you start to develop a right and wrong for yourself. And so I know in, in me, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a church and this was great because it, it helped me understand what's right and what's wrong. It helped me know, okay, I don't want to do this. I do want to do this. Another one is it instilled a sense of purpose. You know, I'm here on this stage today because I gave my life to Jesus. And the moment that I gave my life to Jesus, Jesus spoke. It was July 21st, 1996. It was 8 o'clock at night. It was at a youth revival. My friends called me down front and they asked me, have you ever given your life to Jesus? I broke down in tears and I said, no. I was going into my grade 8 year. Uh, a leader came over. His name was Ed Hallman. He bent down on his knee with me. He led me in the Lord's Prayer, and I was absolutely wrecked for months. Every time I thought about that moment of giving my life to Jesus and never having to worry about you know, my salvation or where I went when I died or anything like that, it, it just brought me to tears. And also, I had spent months and months and probably even a year or so feeling the call of God, but just afraid to take that step. And when I gave my life to Jesus, Jesus said another thing to me. He said, I'm also calling you to foreign missions. I'm giving you a purpose on your life. 
And because of that informed purpose, because of that sense of purpose that I have, that drove me and drove me and drove me. It led me into missions. It led me to quit my job. It led me to fundraising. It led me to South Africa. It led me here to Cape Town. It led me here to this wonderful church. And now Casey and I's lives are blessed all the more for it. And all that came because Jesus and the church, Ed Holloman, my friends, Matt Conkin, Eric Fritz, uh, Matthew Conn, I can remember their names. They, they helped me find that purpose. You know, the church also it serves as a window for a global view. It means that, that Christianity, what you guys see, isn't just right here. It's, it's global. It, it's, it's everywhere. God is moving in a lot of different places. It's easy for us to get sort of zeroed in on what's happening in our you know, tiny little world. It's a nice reminder that the world doesn't revolve around us and that it revolves around the sun, and that God put the sun there, and that we're just a part of the journey going around. And sometimes we all need reminded of that a little bit. And then the fourth thing that, that I feel like it did for me and does for you guys is it taught how to be generous, you know, how to be giving. And, and I know that this church is that. You, you, know what our, you know what's amazing? Our biggest tithe month last year, you know what month it was? It was a month everyone said is supposed to be your lowest. It was December. December was our largest tithe month. That, that's when you should get no money as a church. That's when you plan for no money as a church. Because everyone's buying Christmas gifts. But it was actually our biggest. This church is a generous church because it's taught us to be that. And so that's sort of a statistical case for church. It's sort of a personal case for church. And now the last case that I want to make for why you guys are valuable to this world and why your purpose is valuable here. Why is our second service valuable? Why are the more people that we're making space for valuable? There's those two things. And this third one is, is I think is really, really strong. And it's this, the church provides probably the best argument for dignity of the individual and human rights. So I'll say that again here because that needs to sink in for some of us. The church is what provides the strongest argument for dignity of the individual. That's you and that's the person living under the bridge. That's the oppressed. That's the person that, that has more than they need. The dignity of the individual and human rights. It's the church that's the strongest argument for that. And I'll show, you, I'll show you how. There's a guy named Philip Yancey. I've got a quote from him. And um, he really spoke to this here. And, and, and it's the second part of this quote that, you know, we can really dig out some stuff here about this, the, the church being a part of human rights and stuff. So those who condemn, so he starts his quote with this. Those who condemn the church for its blind spots do so by gospel principles. So what he's saying is, is, if you look at the church and you condemn it for its blind spots, and I know that we're all really good at it. Did you know that there's a website dedicated to trashing Andy Stanley? Did you know there's a, a whole website dedicated to proving why Stephen Furtick and his church elevation are preaching devil stuff? Did, you know, do you know that there's, there's entire organizations that are intent on bringing down Hillsong as a church? You know, did you know that, that there's an entire reporting agency that does nothing but look at a church planting association called ARC and try and just drag their name through the mud and point out all the things that they do wrong? Did you know that that exists? And those are Christians poking holes in the church. I mean, we don't need that. You know, and then you have non-Christians that are criticizing the blind spots of the church. But if you take the Christians and even the non-Christians that are doing that, and you look at how are they criticizing or poking holes in the church, the way that they're doing that is they're basing that on the gospel principles anyway. So what I'm trying to kind of get across with this is that even when people criticize the church, they, whether they know it or not, they're reinforcing the principles that Jesus, as the gospel message, taught and brought to us. They just don't know that they are. And, and the church is oftentimes, you know, has these blind spots and has these faults because it's full of people and people mess up and people make mistakes and people sin. But the gospel principle, which is, it, it's arguing for the very moral values that the gospel originally set loose in the world. 
Even when they don't know they're criticizing the church because of that. It's like, my, it's like our son Benjamin. I'm just trying to think of like, because this was hard for me to even wrap my brain around. It's like Benjamin eating, well, I made him, okay, I made him an egg and cheese sandwich yesterday. Actually, I only cooked the eggs. Casey put the cheese on it and the bread, and then I smashed it down real nice, and it melted the cheese and cut it up into four pieces, and man, this thing looked really, really good. I mean, it looked great, and so Benjamin wakes up from his nap, and you know, he's like, hey, I'm, you know, he, he's hungry. He sits down, we give him the sandwich, and he says, I don't want to eat that, and it's like, well, why don't you want to eat it? Well, I don't like the eggs. And it's like, well, Benjamin, you actually, eggs are one of your favorite things in the world to eat. You love eggs. And so he's, he's using what he likes. He's saying, no, I don't like the sandwich because I don't like eggs. But that morning he ate a plate of eggs. And then when we convinced him that the eggs were the same thing that he ate that morning, he switched and he said, well, I don't like the cheese. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay, fine. Meanwhile, Wyatt's in the background fisting that sandwich that Benjamin's not eating you know, into his mouth, because Wyatt doesn't care. He's just a, a garbage uh, disposal. So, so that, that's kind of this concept of like, I'm going to criticize you, but I'm criticizing you with the principles that I don't believe that you're following. And I don't even know that I'm using gospel principles. That's just what God has sort of put in the world. It's, it's, it's just there. Okay, I'm going to move on just in case I can't explain that really well. But look at the, the second part of this quote. Let's take this. Human rights, all right, civil rights, women's rights, minority rights, gay rights, disability rights, animal rights. Okay, all these things here, and we could add to this list. It could go on, and it could go on, and it can go on. Here's something that we need to know about this. Okay, look at how these things come about here. All of these rights that we claim, take yourself out of the church, even put yourself into the media right now. All the people that claim rights, rights for themselves, rights for other groups, the success of those of these, these are modern movements. The success of these modern movements reflect the spread of empathy for the oppressed that has no precedent in the ancient world. So what this means is this. Before Jesus came, none of those people had rights. And you know why? Because no one cared. No one cared to give them rights because there wasn't that sense of empathy that was out there. In fact, philosophers before Jesus' time, they felt like that traits like empathy or they felt traits like compassion were actually, you know, signs of corruption. That, that in the court, justice, no matter what it was, justice is what prevailed. That there was no empathy. There was no compassion. Those were seen as very weak things. You know, it, it was normal for someone to have the mindset of, why would I give to somebody financially if I know that they're not going to be able to return anything and give it back to me? You know, even if you look at the Old Testament, how much of the Old Testament, and you guys may not know this, but a lot of like Leviticus, those boring books that have all the laws in them, you know, you should do this on the third day, do this on the fourth day, on the third Tuesday of the fourth month of the third quarter of the year, everyone's going to forgive the debt, you know? The reason that God put that in the Old Testament, that God gave Moses that stuff, is because God knew that society and culture had no empathy. It had no compassion for anybody. And so he actually worked it into the law that, that people's debts would be forgiven in certain times of the years. And, and all of these sort of senses of compassion that when they harvested food, that they had to leave some of the grain that fell on the ground. God was saying, don't be petty and sweep up your extra grain. Let someone that doesn't have it come through and glean from what's fallen on the ground. You know, that's what God had to do because society did not do it. And so it was only after Jesus came that these modern movements started to gain the ability, the ability to actually stand up for and say, hey, I, I believe that I have some rights here. Even if it's something that you don't believe does have rights. It has only come about after the ancient world because empathy is no longer oppressed. See, this only changed when Jesus came. And, and, and in fact here, the, the, this is the statement that this whole sort of message hinges on. And it's this, the church is God's agent of transformation. The church is how God is going to bring on transformation. It represents the destination at which the culture needs to aim. And so I want to quickly sort of just break out of 
preaching Chris or communicating Chris. And uh, this is kind of the point in the message where I thought, I actually don't know how much of what I have planned to preach that I'm going to preach because I don't quite know where you guys are, where you guys aren't. And, and, it, and it's just the whole point of this message leading up to this moment here is that I, I want you to understand that you're the church and I want you to understand that, that you play a critically important role. That you as a group impact society. You impact culture. You guys impact not only your neighbors and the people that you work with, but you actually impact what happens all around the world. Because of Jesus, there was a movement of empathy. And because of that movement of empathy, a whole bunch of people that had no credit, no rights, no anything, all of a sudden had those, those rights. Do you know why? Because the New Testament and Jesus teaches us this, is that every person is an image bearer of God. It's not, well... I am an image bearer of God, and you are 60% of that image bearer of God, but 40% of you is wrong. We are all created as equal 100% image bearers of God. And because of that, there has been a change in our entire society around the world that people understand that they have rights, they have value, they matter. Now, some people have used that for the good, and then some people, people like Best Buy, Target, uh, Budweiser, you know, they've tried to use that in a way and it's ended up leaving them completely bankrupt right now. But the point is, is whether it's been used for good or whether it's been used for some other kind of agenda that maybe the world isn't ready for yet, the fact is, is that either one of those it's used because Jesus came. So we find ourselves in this position, you sitting in your chairs right now. You find yourself in this position here. And this is why I'm excited about next week. Is that you all have a responsibility and a role to play without even doing anything. That just simply coming in here or being a part of the church, you are fulfilling a responsibility and a role. And by not even meaning to do anything, you're, you're already doing great things. You're serving, you're volunteering, you're keeping the lights on in here. There's all this great stuff that's happening. But you guys, we have a responsibility to do something even more. And so my takeaway for you this morning is that I, I want you to feel inspired that you can have an impact on, we, we could say the world, but let's say, okay, then there's South Africa, then there's the Western Cape, and then there's Cape Town, and then there's, you know, Pinelands or Rondebosch or Kensington or wherever it is that you live, wherever your, your neighborhood is, wherever your family's at, you can have a direct impact in your home. So we walk around, you guys are walking around with superpowers that you don't even know about. And so I, before I talk about what the church can be, I felt like I needed to make a case for why the church was valuable. And I needed you to understand that you were part of that value and that you are part of the reason why it is valuable. Because next week we start something that's absolutely going to be amazing. And we take a big step of faith. Take a big step of faith as a church. And we're doing it because we believe in God's glory. So I want to walk you through something here. This is our mission and our message as a church. Remember, when I say church, it's, it's you guys. So if we talk about the mission... Why, why are we here? This is what I talked about with direction. We're here because of something that Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19. And, and he said this. He said, go. So this is for you. Everybody say go. Go. Okay. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus says, go make disciples. This wasn't you 12 disciples go make disciples. This wasn't, uh, you know, if you're called or if you have a magic moment, you go make disciples. This was, hey, Christ follower, go and make a disciple. And then what he means by making that disciples, help people learn about Jesus. See, making a disciple, it's not uh, making them sign their life over in blood. Jesus is saying, hey, help me, help people learn of me. Help people to believe in me and help people to Obey my words. You know, I, I hope you believe, and I believe, that the Bible has really great words in it. You know, it gives really good advice. You know, it, even when it, there's, you know, guys, ladies, 
marriages, you guys that are arguing with each other, there's verses in Proverbs that will tell you, just shut your mouth. All right? You know? If you want to know how to deal with an argument, open up Proverbs. There'll be something that tells you, you know, just, just, just stop it. The Bible gives great advice. So the word is, is, is good, and, and we're just helping people to know that word. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is making somebody to where they publicly say, I am a Christ follower. 2023 for me is the year that this church becomes a disciple-making church. And what that means for us is that we care that other people know God. We care that other people love God. And we care and believe that God's word will make their life better. And then we want to help them take the good thing that happened in their life and go and do it in somebody else's life. Is that complicated? Is that scary? Is that, is that, is that, is that, is that too much to ask? Or is that, is that wrong? You, know, you, guys should be, you guys will be very happy that you're not on, on staff with me because I told my staff this week, I said, hey, I want, every, I want all of us to go this week and share an irresistible testimony with somebody. Because if, some, if God did something cool in my life, and I share that cool thing, then that should make somebody else say, well, I want to be a part of that cool thing, and look for that cool thing to happen in their life. You know, if I went to, uh, it, you know, I'm trying to think of good examples. There's not, I was going to the casino here. All right, fine. If I went to the casino... And I found out the third slot machine from the left always hit jackpot, had unlimited money in it. You would probably at some point not be able to carry any more. And you would go get your friends or you would go get, you know, your family. And you would say, you guys got to come and see this. Well, I have something more valuable than money. It's God's love. It's God's word. So if we, okay, guys, if, if we can believe, those of us in this room can believe that it matters that people learn of him. Does it matter that someone knows Jesus? Yes. There's always another person out there that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't have an encounter with him. Once we get them an opportunity to have an encounter with Jesus, if they say no, fine, we're going to love them anyway, who cares? But what if they say yes? Then we've got a life that's changed. Then what do we do with that person that says yes? Do we just leave them and walk away from them? No. That's then when we help them to believe in him, which means when life happens and things get hard, we say, hang in there. I'm there with you. I'm going to walk this road with you. You know, you become their friend. You become their prayer partner. You become their accountability partner. Whatever it is, you become their mentor. You start discipling them and then help it. We want them to know God's word because we believe it makes their life better. It makes our life better. That, that this is our duty. This is our mission as a church. And by church, I mean every person in here that's a follower of Christ. If you're not a follower of Christ, you can just sit back and relax. This isn't on you. But those of you that are, this is not an option. This is what you're called to be. Not as a church in these seats, but as a church in the heart that God is living in, in your life. Now, I want to talk with you about the message. What is it that is the message of South Point. What's the message of us as a church? What message do we take out there? And, and this, I, I love this here, because we all have an agenda on what the message should be, especially as society starts to get wonky and wobble with all the gender stuff and, you know, all of those things. It's like, why, well, you know, here's the message. Here's what you need to know. You know, everyone's kind of taking a position and a, an agenda. People come to me all the time and say, when are you going to stand on stage and say that, you know, hey, everybody that's not married to somebody of the opposite sex is going straight to hell. And I'm like, you know, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. Because here is my message it's the same as your message. And here it is. It's in Matthew here as well. Matthew 22. And Jesus replied to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So I'm putting God above my agenda. Then it goes on. And he says, The second commandment is like this. Because someone had just asked Jesus, What's the most important commandment? And the second one is, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, how much time do you spend condemning yourself to hell because of the decisions that you make? Most of us, not a lot. So why are we now condemning other people to hell because of the decisions that they make? 
does that bring them to church? No. Instead, it equips them with an excuse not to come. Are we okay if people that don't know Jesus don't come to church? I'm not okay with that. Do you know why I'm not okay with that? Because I believe that what we have here is inherently good for somebody. It's good for people. We can do this. And, and, and this is, this, this whole, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Some of us are really bad at loving ourselves. That's okay. You have a low bar. Start loving people in the same way. You know, those of you that love yourselves really well, you can, you know, you raise the bar on how you love people, you know, but, but either way, go and love somebody. You, see, J- Jesus, you cannot find a place in the Bible where Jesus walked up to a sinner and said anything other than you are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, you're healed. There's no other place where Jesus does anything other than that. The only place where Jesus spent more time condemning or convicting or telling people that they were far from God or far from heaven is when it was people that were running the church, people that were in the temple, the Jewish temple. You know, and and this church is not full of of Pharisees and Sadducees. This isn't, that's not us here. I'm not saying that at all. I confidently uh, know that we are not that way. But I'm trying to make the point that that we sit here with so much potential and so much opportunity to just love people and what happens with that. And we get so caught up in, well, if I love them, when do I get to tell them that their life is wrong? (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's that's a great question. But you know what? You first love somebody, and when you get past that, then come talk to me. We'll talk about when you can tell them that their life is wrong. the, The answer to that is never. You know, we, we love each other. We disciple each other. We spend time with each other. You know, and it's through relationship that change happens. And Jesus was attractional. People wanted to be in a relationship with him. Jesus ate with more uh, people that were so far from the church. He spent more time with them than anybody else. He invited them in. They lounged together. They washed each other's feet together. They, they gathered together. Jesus was seen publicly just comfortable with them and them comfortable with him. And what came out of that? His life change came out of that, but it was through relationship of love. That, that's our potential. And, and if, if loving a neighbor as yourself is, okay, if that's not pushing you enough, then in John, Jesus will push you even more. John says, I'm giving you, or Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I, Jesus, have loved you, so you are to love one another. So Jesus loved you enough to die for you, despite all of your sin. Now, this is unobtainable. It's absolutely unobtainable for us to love somebody like Christ exactly loved us because he's perfect, and we're not perfect. But what Jesus is asking us to do is he's saying, hey, don't you ever forget how messed up you are, and how much I forgave you, and how much I cared for you, and how much I did when I sent my son to die on the cross for you. Now you go, and you love your neighbor in the same way. And then when we do this, church, then, then that's when the world knows that this is the church, and that this is set apart from everything else, that we are the most important institution in the world, that we do have the biggest argument for human rights and for advocacy, that that we are the thing that does the best job at raising up people that live happy and whole and complete and put together lives. And, And John even goes on in the next verse here, and Jesus is saying, if you do all of this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you have love and unselfish concern for one another... So, so church, we are responsible for the message and the mission of this church. It's us. It, it's we are. All that stuff about loving and, and about people knowing the God's word and all that stuff, it's not my responsibility. I, I've only got, you know, 45 minutes or so with you here on a Sunday. You guys are the ones that are out there in the world with your reach. You know, you guys keep me so busy, I, it's hard for me to get out in the world. But you guys are out in the world. It's your responsibility. Surprise me. Impress me. Make me proud. Make each other proud. Make Jesus proud. I mean, you don't need my approval, but make God proud. Make God excited. I've got two stories I want to read you before we close. Actually, I've I've sort of three. But the the first one I'll say is, is this. 
is that when, when Casey and I came to Cape Town and we were praying about where to, where to, to do church in the city, I was standing on Table Mountain and um, looking down and was, was praying, and God sort of set up our boundaries for this area. I didn't even know what Pinelands was at the time. And, and I'm standing there, and God gave me this vision. And in this vision, God's sort of hands came down, and, and they drug the earth. So from Bishop's Court all the way out to kind of the blockhouse and on down to the ocean, God's hands just drug all the people, and he picked them up, scooped them up in his hands, and then he dropped them down into a church right here in this area in the southern suburbs. And I asked God, God, to, you know, give me like a word that goes with that. And God said, Chris, all you have to do is have a church that I'm happy with, and I'll fill it. And so, and so I, that's, what, that's what this is. That's why we're splitting to another service, because I believe that God's really happy with this church. He's really happy with you guys. If we do the thing where we take responsibility and we follow those verses and we represent God, we represent Jesus, then God's going to fill this place. Now, I've got another story I want to read you. I found this in one of my devotionals. This is about um, a church in India. And um, as I read this, I think that this is what happens when even a small group of people looking at the impossible capture the hope and, and, and the promise of what Jesus wants to do through his local church. So I'm going to read it here. So in, in the Lone Star Mission, which is uh, at Angoli, India, a faithful few people, they had held on believingly and courageously year after year. The mission's going out of business. Now the mission was about to be abandoned. The work, the work had failed. The money had failed. The only hope now was God. Dr. Jawa and his wife took, them, took with them a, a famous Hindu woman named Julia. And this was nearly 100 years of age. And, and, and they ascended the hills above Angoli to ask God to save Lone Star Mission and those in India who were lost. So these, the, these people, they go up on a hill to pray over a failing mission, a failing church. And they do it because of all the lost people that are in India. They had a burden for the loss. They had a burden for those that weren't in church. And so they prayed. They all prayed and they all believed. They talked and then they prayed again. They wrestled before heaven's throne in the face of a heathen world like Elijah on Carmel. And at last the dawn day broke. Just as the sun rose above the horizon, Dr. Jowett arose out of darkness and he seemed to see a great light. He lifted his hand heavenward and he turned his tear-stained face toward the great heart of love. How many of us in the last few months have shed a tear for the hurting part of this world? I think a lot of us have. So then he declared that his vision, that in his vision he saw the cactus field below the hill transformed into a church and even mission buildings. His faith grasped and it gripped that great fact and he claimed the promise and challenged God to answer a prayer that was entirely for God's own glory and the salvation of men. So here you have on top of this hill, you've just got a bunch, four or five regular people with incredible faith and an incredible burden who grasp the understanding that we're not here to judge, we're here to love, and we're here to tell people about Jesus' love for them because we're the most important institution on this entire planet. And when they did that, when four seemingly insignificant people in India on a hill looking down onto a field of cactus with everything they'd put their money into completely failing, when they did that, the money came immediately and it came from God's hand. Today, on that very cactus field, stands the Christian church with the largest membership of any church on earth. It is recognized as one of the greatest miracles of the modern missionary world. On that well-nigh abandoned field, Dr. Clow, the, the current pastor, baptized 10,000 people in one year. 2,222 in one day. See, prayer meeting hill where they went to pray, it moved the throne of God and it made the world to tremble. The battlements of heaven must have been crowded to watch these many workings of a prayer for his glory. You know, and that just sums it up for me that we do this for God's glory. We, we do this because of who God is. We do it because of how good he is. And, and that takes me back to what God told me, Chris, if I'm happy with it, then I'll fill it. 
See, I, I believe that just like in that story, that when God and the angels look down on us and they hear your prayers, they see your prayers, they see our heart for the city, for our neighbor, for each other. They see that we're not going to be judgmental. We're going to be loving and accept people in and point them to Jesus. Then I just can't think of anything else other than God getting crazy excited to fill this building and to overflow it and for us to double and triple and put another campus somewhere else and grow and grow and grow because it's bringing God's glory to more and more people. That, that's the church that I see. And as we get ready to step into next week where we split and we make a lot of space for a lot of people, then that, that's going to be an exciting time for us because we get to go and do that. So my challenge for you as I you know, close up this message here, and, and we're going to go straight into dismissal because I spoke to you for too long, but my challenge for us is this. We're seven days away from creating space because what's going to happen is when we split into two services, we're going to have a bunch of empty chairs. We're doing a baptism next week. We've got uh, decorations, maybe even like a, a cake or something. I don't know what the team has got plan for it, but it's going to be a big celebration next week, but there's going to be a whole bunch of extra space. So I want you, I'm not going to put you to the same test I put staff to, but I just want you to pray and ask God, God, is there one person that I think this could be good for, whether they're a Christ follower or not? God, is there one person where I think that this could be good for them and then bring them? I've picked a series coming up. It's fun. We're going to do a deep dive into Scripture, but exposing Jesus in some incredible ways. It's going to be a great message over the next three weeks for those new people to come, for people that want to know Jesus and who He is for them to come. So that's going to be your prayer this week. And then next week when we divide, it's going to have a whole bunch of new people that are going to get to encounter the love of Jesus. So. I'm going to pray for us, and after I pray, uh, the band is just going to take us right into our, our kick out, and we'll dismiss. Uh, I do want to thank you guys for coming this morning. Um, it's incredible to see you. Uh, it's incredible to see the amount of people that we have here today and all your lovely faces. So I'm going to pray for us, and then I'll dismiss. Heavenly Father, uh, we just thank you so much um, for the calling that you put on us as the church, the calling to be the most important institution in the world because of your love. Um, you've armed and equipped every single person with something really special that nobody else has. And, and that's, that's your love. And um, we thank you for that, Lord. And so I pray this week as, as everyone in here goes out, I pray that they, I pray that you speak to every single person. And when you speak to every person that you put somebody on their heart, when you put somebody in your heart, I pray that you put an excitement, a burden, a conviction on their heart. Uh, so even right now, Lord, bring a name to every mind just right now. Just pop a name in everyone's head. Just a name that comes up, a name that comes into their heart, a name that comes into their mind. And for those of you that have a name that pop up, just accept it. Don't argue with it. Just accept it. And then this week, give them the courage to go and talk to that person and say, hey, there's something good here for you. It's a good time. It's fun. It's good for you. And I want you to be a part of it. So Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do this week and in this new season for us as a church. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.